delightful to see you here tonight. I actually originally was going to say it's delightful. I was delighted to see so many of you here tonight, and I am, but I am rather shocked that we, we have some seats available in the, uh, in the audience. But um, so this presentation is going to be uh, broadcast live on Davidson College's YouTube channel. Uh, and thank you to those of you in the audience for being here in person. And thanks to all those joining us live on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. Um, so this, uh, the live stream is available at www.youtube.com slash Davidson College. Um, this evening's lecture by Masha Gessen is uh, made possible by the Dean Rusk International Studies Program, the Williamson Endowment, Gender, uh, Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, and Russian Studies Department, as well as the indefatigable efforts of Meg Sawicki. Where is Meg? Please a round of applause to Meg for making all of this really happen. It Um, so, as many of you know, uh, Marsha Gessen is a staff writer uh, at The New Yorker, a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, and um, John J. McCloy, class of 1916, professor of American institutions and international diplomacy at Amherst College, where she teaches such courses as Americans Writing Russia, 100 Years On, and the Media and the 2016 Campaign. In fact, it is since the 2016 presidential campaign and its shocking results that Marsha emerged as one of the nation's leading public intellectuals, reminding us how fragile democracies are and how swiftly we can lose our rights as citizens. Even if you haven't read one of Marsha's 11 books, including The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, which won the National Book Award for Nonfiction in 2017. Marsha, congratulations again. That's a huge deal. And um, by the way, the book is available for purchase right um, uh, right outside the Tyler Tolman Hall, if you're interested. Uh, Main, Street's, uh, Main Street Book here at Davidson was kind enough to, uh, to come here with the, with the books, if you're interested. But even if you haven't read one of Marsha's books, um, which you really should read, um, you have probably seen her uh, appear on BBC, PBS, MSNBC, or Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, <laughs> where she patiently and expertly um, is explaining the dangers of our current political predicament, encouraging us to imagine the unimaginable and to stay outraged as a means of protecting the present and securing a chance at a better future. In her own words, Masha once said, and I quote, I have lived in autocracies most of my life, and I have spent much of my career writing about Vladimir Putin's Russia. I have learned a few rules for surviving in an autocracy and salvaging your sanity and self-respect." End of quote. She wrote this in her brilliant article called Autocracy, Rules for Survival, which was shared countless times on social media and helped many of us cope with the sobering reality last year. In that article, Masha argued that failure to imagine the future comes at a great cost. In much of her writing, she explores various configurations of what the future could have been and why certain futures never come while others unexpectedly trap us. Or rather, we perceived certain events as unexpected while Masha elegantly and directly shows us the ways in which we were missing the signs of what was to come. From a failed utopia in, your, in her book, Where the Jews Aren't, the sad and absurd story of Birabidjan, Russia's autonomous region, to uh, successful totalitarianism in her biography of Putin, The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. One of the major themes of Masha's writing has to do with LGBTQ life, queer promise, and queer futurity. Her very first book, if I'm not mistaken, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but that first book was a report on the rights of lesbians and um, gay men in the Russian Federation, published in 1994. Since then, she wrote on the feminist protest punk rock group Pussy Riot, on the so-called gay propaganda law in Russia, and on the um, persecution of gay men in Chechnya, to name just a few topics. In the late 1980s and the early 1990s, she was associated with the legendary direct advocacy group ACT UP. And true to the motto of ACT UP, 
silence equals death. Masha consistently speaks up, expands our field of vision, and argues against the embrace of a, of a toxic nostalgia for a past that never was. Her talk today is called Why the Gays? A History of the Kremlin's Gay Bashing. To reiterate, uh, this lecture serves as the keynote address for a symposium called Queer Russia, Gender, Sexuality, and Race that will take place tomorrow. And we have eight outstanding speakers from all over the country who will be presenting their research uh, here at Davidson tomorrow in the Carolina Inn, beginning at 10 a.m. But for now, please welcome Masha Gessen. Thank you. Am I on? Thank you. Thank you, Roman, for that introduction. That's, I don't know if I can live up to it, but that was, uh, it was beautiful to listen to. Thank you. Um, so um, when I set out to write this book, The Future is History, one of the things that I was going to write about, uh, one of the, sort of the, the main themes of the book was going to be, first of all, building up to the beginning of this um, anti-gay campaign. Um, and then trying to, to detail it without, hopefully, falling into the trap of making sense of it. Uh, because one shouldn't generally uh, be tempted to make sense of something that's intended to be terror. Right? It's, it's, it's nonsensical nature. N nonsensical nature is an integral part of it. Um, but I had a hypothesis for what I was going to find once I started trying to figure out why the gays? My hypothesis was uh, basically uh, consisted of three parts. So one was that um, the, when the protests broke out in Russia in 2011-2012, Putin needed some way to discredit the protesters, to smear the protesters, and so they tried all sorts of things. You know, and uh, I mean, he he generally reaches below the belt when he tries to discredit something, and so his first uh, uh, the first remark that he made on the protest was to say that he had mistaken the white ribbons that protesters were wearing for a spent condom. Um, and in sort of in the cacophonous way in which uh, the Kremlin usually attacks, um, I thought that I would find that they hurled lots of insults and this one got traction. And I think that there, 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 there's something to it. Um, the other part of my hypothesis was that I was going to find that it's it's sort of the perfect universal smear, right? Um, you can, um, I mean, the queers are the perfect other. They're better than the Jews. Uh, they, um, you know, for, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that no one actually knows a gay or lesbian person, right? No one has seen a real live one. Maybe you know someone has seen one on television, but no one knows an actual human being who's gay or lesbian. And this, uh, to the extent that we can trust public opinion surveys in Russia, certainly this this seems to be borne out. So it's an abstraction. Um, they are not from Russia, right? There were no gay and lesbian people in Russia before the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, and this is actually, you know, it's true. There were no gay and lesbian people in Russia before the Soviet Union collapsed. There were people who had sex with people of the same sex. There were people who had relationships and love relationships and all sorts of interesting family constellations. But there weren't people who said, we are gay or lesbian. We belong to a group that is united by its identity and that has rights because it's a group with a unifying identity. Right, so you can point to that and say, that's Western, that's imported, that's other. And it can stand in for everything that makes you uncomfortable about the life you're living today. And so it, it holds the ultimate promise of the imaginary past, which is, of course, the, the, the demagogue's appeal. And we know a lot about that now in this country. But by sort of saying, you know, we can get rid of the gays, Putin could say we can get rid of everything that has made you uncomfortable since the Soviet Union collapsed, and we can go back to the perfect Soviet reality which never existed, where no, there were no irritants and there was nothing that made you uncomfortable. And so I thought, you know, this was, this was uh, sort of a fine working hypothesis, and then I set out to, um, to figure out when it started and how it started, and I started digging, 
And the dig kind of immediately went in some unexpected directions. Um, and I'm actually going to read um, a piece from the book because I think that, um, I think I probably sum it up better here than I can do it um, by paraphrasing. So um, this is, this is a, um, a piece about one of the um, main characters in the book, uh, whose name is Lyosha Garshkov. Some of you actually know Lyosha Garshkov. He is a wonderful queer activist from uh, Perm who ran the Gender Studies Center at Perm State University until he didn't, uh, and until he had to run for his life. So um, uh, th this, this part begins with Lyosha. Lyosha had been watching for years as the idea of the pedophile threat took shape. He had written about it in his undergraduate thesis. Prominent Perm factory owner and politician Igor Postukhov, a United Russia member, was first accused of raping a 16-year-old boy in 2003. Soon after, the charges were dropped and the politician's accusers seemed to vanish. But a second teenager came forward in 2005. Rumor in Perm had it that another powerful local businessman had manufactured the case to discredit Postukhov. But Losha met young men who told him that it had happened to them too. Postukhov's people were in the habit of hunting down very young men in and around cruising areas and either luring or, if that failed, forcing them into cars and delivering them to Postukhov and his friends, who raped them. When Postukhov faced trial, Perm newspaper headlines were, Perm has been overtaken by the gay lobby, faggots think they're above the law, and administration had better straighten out its orientation. What little evidence was presented at the trial was circumstantial, and Postukhov's accuser was never identified. Postukhov was sentenced to six years imprisonment. Lyosha struggled with the Postukhov story in his thesis. On the one hand, the trial was a travesty. On the other, Lyosha was convinced that Postukhov was guilty of just these sorts of crimes. Then there was the problem of the media coverage, which equated pedophilia and sexual violence with homosexuality. Later, Lyosha learned how to separate these facts and ideas from one another. The Russian courts listened to the prosecutor and accepted the, uh, the Russian courts listened to the prosecutor and accepted thin evidence, bad evidence, or no evidence at all. But this did not mean that everyone they sentenced was innocent. It just meant that no one, including the guilty, ever got a fair trial. In this case, the fact that charges against Postokhov involved same-sex contact was, was what had excited the media. Similar violence perpetrated against girls and young women was more likely to be seen as a normal attribute of power. For example, a Pskov bank owner and politician, Igor Provkin, was accused of rape by several different young women over the course of six years. He finally faced charges after he lured a young woman into his car in central Moscow and raped her right there in broad daylight. He confessed and was given a suspended sentence of four years. The case grew, uh, drew scant media attention. By 2008, the year after Losha defended his thesis, the pedophile menace was becoming a commonplace of public rhetoric. Dugin, Alexander Dugin, the, um, uh, I, I hesitate actually to characterize him, <laughs> you know, him, um, uh, <laughs> called for Russian men to kill pedophiles on sight. In St. Petersburg, a retired boxer, Alexander Kuznetsov, faced charges for killing a 19-year-old man whom he said he had caught trying to rape his eight-year-old stepson. No evidence of the attempted rape was ever produced, but the boxer, who, despite a long arrest record, was not placed in pretrial detention, became an instant celebrity. It is hard, it is hard for him to walk down the street in Petersburg, reported it as Vestia. People stop to shake his hand and ask for an autograph. Dugin told journalists that he supported Kuznetsov. He stood up for his child, he said. I believe that all Russians, all normal people, should act in that exact way. If you see a crime like this happening, you should intervene. And if there is a way to kill the lowlife, then it is necessary to kill and then sort it out later. That's the only way we can change public opinion, the only way to get lawmakers to respond. The headline of the article in which Dugin was quoted was, what is to be done with pedophiles, the death penalty or castration? Such were apparently the terms of the proposed debate. And the debate was framed in a way familiar from the Soviet era when concerned members of society demanded, um, 
restrictive measures against particular groups or individuals. And the state apparatus obliged. Kuznetsov served just over a year behind bars. This is the, guy, the boxer who killed the 19-year-old. By the time he was released in 2010, the debate was raging. A group of parliament members filed a bill that would increase penalties for sexual crimes against children. The bill was so hastily drafted that different passages specified different new penalties for the same crimes. This delayed the bill, prompting the chairwoman of the Parliamentary Committee on the Family, Yelena Mizulina, to accuse United Russia of harboring a pedophile lobby. Mizulina herself was a member of A Just Russia, the latest party created by the Kremlin to imitate a populist electoral alternative. United Russia countered that the latest political pedophilia scandal had concerned a Just Russia member. This was the case of a parliament member's assistant in the city of Volgograd who managed to escape from police who were arresting him. Whichever party was speaking and whichever party it was blaming, a consensus emerged in parliament. They had in their ranks a pedophile lobby that was sabotaging the protection of children. A parliament member from the Communist Party lamented that many of her colleagues had been ensnared by a secret, powerful, pervert organization. The pedophilia accusation became a potent weapon of political warfare. While par parliament members were hurling accusations at one another, political scientist Andreas Umland discovered, the, and this is um, a German political scientist living in Ukraine, writing about the Russian far right, discovered that Russian and Ukrainian media were reporting that he had been charged with sex offenses against children. The reports were full of details about Umland's legal troubles, all of them imaginary. Umland traced the original report to a Russian online news agency, which in turn could be traced to IP addresses used by Dugin and his Eurasian movement. Dugin's media had been attacking Umland since he wrote his Oxford dissertation, in which he compared Dugin's movement to Nazism. Quote, most liberal sociologists in Germany are homosexuals, reported one of the articles on Umland. And as we know, 60% of them are infected with HIV. So the question arises, why are homosexuals with AIDS telling us what is right and what's wrong? A follow-up piece claimed that Umland, who has pedophile proclivities, has been fired from Stanford, Harvard, and Oxford for making homosexual advances to his colleagues. Umland was very flattered to have learned that he had been fired from all these prestigious universities. <laughs> um, in the Russian parliament, the crusading members never managed to clear up the textual contradictions in the bill so the Kremlin introduced its own. Legislation increasing penalties for sex offenders was passed in the fall of 2011. Repeat offenders would now face life imprisonment, the maximum penalty uh, possible in Russia for any crime, but the crusaders were not satisfied and continues to, continued to insist on chemical castration. The new law introduced a new concept, that of a person afflicted with pedophilia. A defendant diagnosed with pedophilia was now subject to compulsory psychiatric treatment. Psychiatrists had to be trained to diagnose pedophilic sexual orientation. Letters went out to every psychiatric clinic in the land. Large psychiatric hospitals dispatched doctors for training sessions in Moscow at the Serbsky Center for, uh, at the Serbsky Center for Social and Court Psychiatry, once infamous as the place where Soviet dissidents were sent for punitive treatment. Participants in Serbsky seminars were taught that perversions were often diagnosed together. For example, pedophilia frequently went with homosexuality. Even while the parliament was debating new anti-pedophile measures, the police redoubled their efforts. In July 2011, the Minister of the Interior reported that law enforcement was pursuing 128 different cases of online distribution of pornographic images of minors, that this was just for the first three months of the year and the number represented a 20% increase over the entire year before. Activist citizens began looking for pedophiles too. A 21-year-old college dropout in Varonezh devoted herself to the hunt full time. Anna Levchenko claimed to have identified the names and IP addresses of 80 pedophiles in the space of six months. Quote, the number of sex offenses against children has nearly doubled in the last year, declared her LiveJournal.com page. A manifesto full of bold-faced emphasis followed. Pedophiles are afraid of nothing and no one. They're everywhere. They are united. There are hundreds of thousands of them. They have cast their nets over the entire world. They challenge our entire society and they are laughing at us. 
They're trying to tell us that no one will ever be able to protect our children from them. I will prove them wrong. If law enforcement can't deal with it, then society itself must rise up in defense of the children. I identify pedophiles on the internet and collect evidence against them. I make sure that criminal charges are filed. I work with a group of like-minded people. We write dozens of reports every week. Thousands of people read my blog every day. We need your help too. You can join our team and help us catch those who are killing our children. Only if we unite our efforts will we be able to defeat this threat. Any support you can lend will help us save hundreds of, thousands, uh, hundreds of children's lives and prevent new crimes. Levchenko developed her own entrapment techniques and then trained other young people to use them. She attended the Kremlin Youth Training Camp at Lake Seliger in the summer of 2011 and was granted an audience with Medvedev, then the president, if anybody remembers, uh, so that she could tell him about her work. She informed the president that her movement included 300 volunteers. Medvedev praised Levchenko's efforts and suggested incorporating her group into the investigative committee, the Federation's Central Anti-Crime Unit, by creating a special anti-pedophile project there. The president's children's rights ombudsman, Pavel, Pavel Astachov, perhaps fearful of being left out of the loop, immediately offered Levchenko an assistant position, albeit an unsalaried one. So that's, that took us from 2008 to 2011. And I have to say uh, that with the exception of, of once running into a, an old friend who was studying how pedophilia and homosexuality go together at a Serbsky seminar, I was pretty oblivious to this. And then, um, I and a lot of other people stopped being oblivious to this anti-pedophilia campaign when the Makarov case occurred. Right? And I'm going to read another shorter excerpt on the, on the Makarov case. Um, so Vladimir Makarov was a young civil servant. He had moved to Moscow in 2009 to take a job at the transportation ministry. His wife and young daughter joined him once he, uh, his wife and young daughter joined him once he had fixed up a rental apartment. In the summer of 2010, Makarov's seven-year-old daughter fell off a home climbing wall, fracturing a vertebra. A lab technician thought she saw traces of sperm in the girl's urine sample when she was brought to the hospital by ambulance. A nurse reported it. Later tests of the same sample failed to confirm the results. A physical exam produced no evidence of sexual abuse. And neither the little girl nor her mother nor anyone else gave any testimony that could be interpreted as confirming the charge against Makarov. Nonetheless, he was jailed, held in pretrial detention for a year, and sentenced to 13 years behind bars for raping his own daughter. He appealed, and on November 29, 2011, Moscow City Court downgraded the charge from rape to indecent assault and reduced his sentence to five and a half years. This was probably the worst moment in the whole awful story. By removing the rape charge, the court was disavowing the only basis for the entire case, the supposed finding of traces of sperm in the girl's urine. And still this man, who had done nothing wrong and had already spent a year in jail, would be staying in prison for four more. Why? Because Ella Paniyach, an American-educated Russian sociologist who had for years been studying law enforcement, wrote a piece she titled, And Now the Most Frightening Thing of All Has Happened. It began, and as is its habit, disaster struck where we least expected it. Panayach used the term the red wheel to refer to the force that had plowed Makarov down. The red wheel was the title of a trilogy by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in which he described the destruction of the Russian state by the First World War and the Bolshevik Revolution. Panayach used the term to refer to Russian law enforcement. Her point was that it too was an inexorable disaster. She wrote, it has forgotten what it's like to encounter resistance. It lacks a built-in function for compromise, retreat, even for saying something like released upon a closer examination of the evidence. All the mechanisms that could have been employed for this purpose have long since rusted out for disuse. In fact, the machine's only possible response to resistance is a crackdown. Makarov was doomed as soon as he was first suspected, falsely, of having sexually abused his daughter. His attempts to fight the charges, he asked for further tests, mounted authority defense, and then appealed his sentence, only made the law enforcement machine pursue him harder. This was not a new mechanism. Law enforcement and the courts had functioned this way for a long time, 
In fact, they had functioned this way in the Soviet era, and the system was never dismantled, only temporarily weakened in the 1990s. But for most of the post-Soviet period, the punitive force had been applied almost exclusively to a few clearly defined groups of people. Entrepreneurs engaged in property disputes select politicians, who were also more often than not entrepreneurs engaged in property disputes, and radical political activists. In other words, people risked being crushed by the red wheel only after they ventured into the public realm. What had changed, changed now, wrote Paniach, was that the state had once again found the time, means, and energy to insert its tentacles into a person's private life, a lot deeper than the ever average person is prepared to let it. The process had been underway for, uh, for some time, but most Russians had not noticed, in part because they had grown accustomed to feeling separate from the state. While they were not paying attention, the state had begun regulating what people ate and drank, often introducing seemingly arbitrary rules for political reasons, like when it had banned wine imports from Georgia or sprats from Latvia. The regulating agency invariably justified its decisions by the need to protect the population from potentially dangerous products. The parliament had been discussing restricting abortion. It had hardened drug laws to the point where pain relief had become virtually inaccessible, even for people with documented severe pain. Roughly half of more than a million inmates of Russian prisons were serving time for drug offenses because even a minuscule amount could land one behind bars. As new laws piled up, political discussion, such as it was, centered on the need to protect children from drugs, from abortions, and perhaps most important, from pedophiles. So this was, um, this was how the, this poor unsuspecting guy named Makarov ended up uh, a civil servant, a pro thoroughly pro-Putin civil servant, ended up suddenly um, conf confronted with the entire state machinery. Um, but what was really remarkable about this case, uh, which I suspect, I suspect the circumstances of the case are not unique, what was remarkable about this case is that it somehow captured the imagination of thousands of Russians. Uh, it, the muckraking newspaper Novaya Gazeta wrote about it, and then a, an online community called the Makarov case appeared. And there were thousands of participants in the online community, and several dozen of them were very actively involved. And so they were scanning and uploading every document that was entered in the case, every uh, you know, the genetic um, analysis, uh, every piece of testimony, uh, everything. And then there were hundreds of other people who were printing this stuff out and, uh, and, and studying it themselves. And seeing for the first time, and for most of them, not for the first time you know, since the Soviet Union collapsed, but for the first time in their lives, because they were young enough, um, what, this, what this looks like. Right? And um, so Makarov is, was sentenced on November 29, 2011. And on that date, some uh, day, a member of that Makarov case community online put out a call for people to um, help him organize a protest. He said uh, these people were not experienced in organizing protests, but he had read the rules and he had read that uh, you need three people to apply for a permit to organize a protest. And so a couple of people immediately responded that they would, um, they would participate in this. And then, just as they were trying to figure out how to register this protest, they found out that there was a protest going on on, um, on December 5th, uh, 2011. And so the, uh, the normal, the, sort of the, the, the accepted narrative, well, there are a couple of accepted narratives uh, about, uh, about the protest of, of, on December 5th, um, 2011. Um, but we all generally believe that, uh, that people went to that protest because there were outraged about um, uh, the, the, the blatant falsification of elections. Right? The, uh, the parliamentary elections had taken place the day before, December 4th. And then this protest, which was a regularly scheduled protest, which a couple of uh, uh, diehard organizers um, had planned, and they expected that, as usual, two to 300 people would show up, probably fewer because it was raining and cold. All of a sudden, 10,000 people show up. And what we know as the protest movement, which it probably wasn't really a movement, a protest culture, the protest thing, uh, takes off um, in Russia and lasts up until uh, Putin's inauguration um, in May. 
Now, I'm not making any claims to um, uh, that that you know some significant number or you know. Um, or a very significant number of people who came to that protest came because of the Makarov case uh, rather than because of the elections. Although, as it happens, uh, when I started out uh, to follow uh, people uh, for this book and sort of to interview them uh, and talk about their personal political development, I did not expect that uh, in, in both cases of people who were became active participants of the protests, what had brought them to the process was actually not the elections, but the Makarov case. I learned that as we got in the chronology of the interviewing uh, to, to the protests. Now, of course, the, you know, that's a sample of two, and um, even a 100% result doesn't tell us anything. Uh, but what I do think is that um, there, was, uh, it, there was this confrontation um, with the state, uh, and and it's, and it's good to use the Makarov, Makarov case to sort of complicate an understanding of that confrontation. It was not just the fact that people were um, outraged by the spectacle of these blatantly falsified elections. Uh, it was for people a, a, you know, a set of different and complicated negotiations about where their agency ended and the state began. And so the Makarov case was an important part of that. And now, of course, the, uh, the Kremlin framed the conflict that was playing out for the next six months in the streets of Moscow and 98 different cities and towns in Russia as actually a conflict between an orderly state and a spoiled, wealthy, urban middle class that um, I was disaffected and wanted, uh, didn't want that kind of um, order and wanted something else, something strange, something maybe a little bit queer. Um, and um, the, the unfortunate thing, uh, I mean, we, the sociology doesn't bear this out, right? We know that, uh, uh, that people who participated in these protests in Moscow and elsewhere, first of all, you know, it's not true that, they, that the protests were largely limited to Moscow. There were a whole bunch of cities and towns where proportionally the number of people participating in the protests were much, was much higher than in Moscow. Um, but also we know that uh, there were people from all different socioeconomic cl uh, classes. There were people who used different kinds of media who came to the protests through different ways of receiving that information. Uh, who had different political beliefs, um, and the only thing that, that is at all sort of statistically anomalous about them, that, that, that unifies them at all, is that they were more educated than Russians on average. Right? Um, but the thing about narratives like the disaffected middle class is that, of course, it's not just the Kremlin that advanced, it was really successful, and so both sides kind of bought it. Right? And that, I think, played into this understanding of, uh, of these protests as a conflict between a westernizing middle class um, and a traditionalist uh, law enforcing state. And, um, and then it becomes a conflict between people who aren't willing to let the state into their lives and the state which has to continue expanding in order to survive. Right? So in very much the same way that Panyach describes the way that, um, that the red wheel keeps going. It's actually the red wheel of the entire state keeps going against these people who, um, for lack of a better story, are starting to think of themselves as part of this disaffected urban middle class. And that tension then gets pedophiled and queered. Right? We, use, we, we um, uh, sort of the term to pedophile is, 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 is a term that has been used to describe how, uh, how anti-gay campaigns sort of pull up this, this fear of pedophilia uh, and, the, um, and the, the, the need to protect the children uh, in order to gain power. Uh, but this, this one worked a little bit backwards or actually maybe kind of forwards where the, 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 the pedophiling happened first and then the gays were added on top which is something that I really didn't expect to find. Uh, but apparently the foundation had been built before sort of we started seeing how it played out, how, um, 
how the actual building sort of was constructed. And how the actual building was constructed was that uh, the anti-gay campaign uh, began in earnest in the spring of 2012, right after the presidential election, just as, uh, or the, the, the so-called presidential election, uh, just as uh, Putin started cracking down on the protesters. Uh, it was framed, of course, in terms of protecting the children. The, uh, uh, we usually hear about the passage of the law uh, against uh, gay propaganda. It wasn't the only law passed. Uh, um, so there was the, the, uh, the law on gay propaganda was actually an amendment to the law for the protection of children from harmful information. Uh, now, as a journalist, I had been working a lot with the law for the protection of children from harmful information. In professional circles, we just called it the, the law for the protection of children from information uh, because uh, that's how it was written. Um, and um, it was uh, according to this law, which went into effect in the summer of 2012, it was um, every uh, kind of um, media, every kind of printed material, uh, any kind of any type of dissemination had to be marked with an age appropriate marker. Right? So every book, every television show, every magazine. Um, and, uh, and then there, it contained fairly detailed, uh, the, 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 the um, amendments to the law contained fairly detailed classifications of what children could and couldn't know. So for example, uh, children are never allowed to know anything. Children of any age are never allowed to know anything about suicide. So that has given uh, rise to a new media convention in, in, in Russia where if a newspaper is reporting on, or a website is reporting on a suicide, then instead of using the word suicide, they just use the word uh, Roskomnadzor, the name of the uh, oversight agency that enforces the law on the protection of children from information. So it began with a, with a story, I think, out of Saratov where, where it was actually in the headline. Um, and the headline was, uh, a, a teenage girl has Roskomnadzor. And then, uh, and I think the body of the article was something like, uh, under circumstances which we cannot describe, a person whom we cannot identify it has done the thing that we cannot name. <laughs> and, uh, and that sort of sums up the, um, the law for the protection of children from information. Children are not supposed to know that there are wars. Children are not supposed to know that there's violence. Uh, uh, children uh, may start learning a little bit about uh, you know, secondary sexual characteristics after, their uh, after the age of 12. Um, so it actually, it, uh, I mean, the effect that it has had on publishing is like weirdly infantilizing because every Every book, uh, you know, they're like large print books or, uh, or books that would be large print books in, in the United States for, you know, your, your first book for, se for six and seven year olds are translated into Russian and marked as books for 12 year olds uh, because con they contain information about, you know, death. Uh, and you know, you'd be amazed how many children's books contain information about death and violence and, um, and all sorts of horrible stuff. So anyway, that was in place. And then the law on uh, the, the ban on, on, on so-called gay propaganda was actually an amendment to that very large and very detailed law on the protection of children from information. And um, the champion of the law on, the, uh, on gay propaganda was Yelena Mizulina, the very person you heard earlier in this talk uh, worrying about the presence of the pedophile lobby in the Russian parliament. Um, she, um, she really did not uh, fare well in the, in the pedophile debates. She came very close to being discredited for not being vigilant enough about pedophiles. And then she became super vigilant about the gays. Uh, and um, so that, um, that law was passed in, final, in its final two readings on June 11th, uh, 2013. A week later, in a much less publicized move, uh, the parliament amended the laws on adoption to ban adoption by same-sex couples or single people um, from uh, countries where, uh, where same-sex marriage is legal, which basically laid the groundwork for removing children, uh, adopted children 
from uh, same-sex households. Um, it and those kinds of removals began immediately, um, and they they have they have continued. They're not just same-sex households, but any household that um, that the social services perceive as being sexually inappropriate. Uh, so most recently in Yekaterinburg, uh, two children, uh, two adopted children were removed from um, a, a, a household, where, a, a heterosexual family's household where the wife had begun transitioning. And so the social services swooped in and removed the children. Uh, Mizulina then promised that they would also create a law for the removal of biological children from same-sex families, uh, and that law was never passed. But it's it's um, uh, the bill has been filed in parliament. It's been sitting around for years, but of course Russia is such an interesting legal regime that a law doesn't actually have to exist to be enforced. A law is an understanding, um, you know, a sense of being in the world. So social services have also uh, been threatening and and attacking um, biological uh, families. So um, all of that sort of uh, did not exactly disprove my hypothesis about how the, uh, 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 how the anti-gay campaign came into being. And it certainly, it, I mean, I think it did have a lot to do with needing to, um, to discredit the protesters. I think it, uh, queers are the perfect scapegoat. I think that the demagogic appeal of it is undeniable, but but I think it's also important to understand the, the, that, that, that pedophiling foundation and also to understand the links between the anti-gay campaign and the ways that, uh, that the state has been, uh, has been weaponizing these pedophilia smears and charges against the differently minded. You know, most prominently, uh, there was the case of Yuri Dmitriev in Petrozavodsk, who's a memory activist uh, in Karelia who was arrested and accused of keeping child pornography on his, uh, on, uh, on his computer. It was a huge outcry uh, and a, and a, and a uh, public lobbying campaign, which took a long time to get started. And the reason it took a long time to get started is because it's so scary to come near a case like that and to try to, 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 de to defend someone like that, which is, of course, uh, the idea, you know, who's going to stand up for, uh, for, the, for the pedophiles. So, um, so it took months for people to come to Dmitriev's defense, where I think had he been charged with drug possession, uh, assault, battery, or murder, uh, a public campaign in his defense would have, would have, would have happened right away. Uh, similar, what may have been a similar case was uh, the case against Vladimir Bukovsky in London. Uh, a Soviet dissident who has been extremely critical of Putin uh, and who even tried to run for president once uh, in, uh, in Russia was charged by the British police with having child pornography. Uh, he seems to have made a convincing case that the pornography was planted on his computer and then he was then reported to the British police so that he would be arrested and discredited. Uh, and of course that also took a very, very long time for him to show. The charges were ultimately dropped, but um, but it's it's almost a foolproof. The sort of uh, the, the 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 pedophiling tactic is almost foolproof, and when it's combined with 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 querying, it's really fail safe. So I'll stop there and take questions. Um, <clears throat> sorry, a little sick here. Um, so after the Helsinki Accords in 1975, where I feel like dissidents and human rights activists might have had more legitimacy on a legal platform um, in the midst of a lot of controlling of information under the Soviet Union, how, how has the evolution of human rights um, come about in Russia? Would you say that since then, has there been more legitimacy for human rights in general, or, or has Putin brought a, a big, a big return to controlling information and um, squashing the voices of dissidents? It's kind of a, a big question. Are you asking about the concept of human rights or are you asking about sort of the state of, human, uh, of what we think of as human rights? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. 
<laughs> okay. But maybe uh, yeah. I'm uh, sorry. No, never mind. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, the, okay, the, the state of what we think of as human rights is sort of the easier but less interesting uh, question to answer. Um, if your baseline is 1975, then things are a lot better. Uh, but <laughs> if um, uh, if you choose a different baseline, uh, then it doesn't. Uh, it looks pretty depressing. And um, and the thing is, with every passing year. Uh, Russian citizens have fewer rights, fewer rights to freedom of speech, fewer rights to, to information, fewer rights, fewer rights to assembly, uh, fewer rights to freedom of religion um, than they did you know, last year. And, and last year they had fewer rights than they did, they did the year before. And that process has basically been going on for 18 years. So, um, so in that sense, uh, things maybe are still are still better than they were in 1985. But in 1985, they were a hell of a lot better than they had been uh, in 1945, and now they're a lot worse than they uh, than they were in 1985. Um, as for the concept of human rights, uh, that's actually the the, the harder uh, but more interesting uh, question to try to answer. You know, when uh, when the Soviet Union signed on to the Helsinki Accords. Uh, this, from what we know, you know, Soviet leaders really thought that that was um, that was a formal thing that they were going to be able to sign, never think about again, and get some benefits, um, some major economic benefits that that the country needed at the time. And um, and there were a few um, very bright and very imaginative people in the Soviet Union who decided to latch on to this idea of human rights and this obligation that the Soviet Union had taken on um, in order to, uh, to demand you know, the observance of these, uh, of these laws and also to, to draw the world's attention to the state of political freedoms in the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and they were, you know, they took extraordinary measures like drafting letters about this uh, in, you know, while, um, um, uh, drafting an appeal about, uh, about the non-observance of the Helsinki Accords to, to an OSC meeting uh, while jailed in Perm 36 and uh, you know, writing it on tiny little, uh, on very, very thin cigarette sort of type paper, um, sealing it in plastic, swallowing it, uh, extracting it uh, while um, on a conjugal visit with the wife, <laughs> having the wife, having the wife swallow it and smuggle it out so that it could be read at the Helsinki at, uh, at the Helsinki Accords meeting, uh, and um, and get attention, and um, and somehow their efforts were really effective at establishing the validity of this concept, both uh, internationally and inside the Soviet Union. And that's something that that actually the Putin regime has put a major dent into. And uh, one of Dugin's favorite things to say, and this is something that Putin has very much borrowed from him, is there's no such thing as universal human rights. Uh, if you people want to have human rights over there where you live, that is your choice, and and and, and go to, go ahead and enjoy it, and um, you know sink into decadence. Uh, uh, and um, but we are a traditional value civilization, and don't. Um, don't you know stuff those uh, uh, non-universal human rights down our throats with your ideas about homosexuality, and those of course go hand in hand. Hi, this is maybe a more technical question, but in terms of like the conception of the gay propaganda amendment. And the thing, like the activities mentioned in that, what could you be prosecuted for initially, and what were people being prosecuted for, and now how has that changed, and what new things are being like read into this and reinterpreted into it, and kind of how are you afraid that it will continue to escalate? Right. Yeah, thank you for that question because I actually should have addressed that. Um, so the gay propaganda law is not there to be enforced. That's not you know that's not the point of the law. The point of the law is to serve as a um, as a message, and the message is in the way that the law is interpreted uh, by uh, there's a there's a constitutional court definition of what co constitutes uh, propaganda of, of non-traditional sexual relations, uh, 
and the, that definition is it is the uh, intentional and uncontrollable dissemination of information that can cause harm to the physical or spiritual development of children, including forming in them the, in that, uh, the erroneous impression of the social equality of traditional and non-traditional marital relations. Right? So it creates a, an understanding that there are second class relationships and se second class citizens. Or to put it more bluntly, it creates a group of people who under no circumstances should be safe in, um, in, in that country. It creates a group of people who don't have human rights because they're not fully human. Right? Uh, and what that translates into, of course, is not prosecutions, it's violence. And most recently and most horrifyingly, it translates logically, inevitably, into the kind of violence that we have seen in Chechnya which is simply carrying out that message you know, and showing that it has been received. And that's, you know, the, 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 there hundreds of men have been rounded up, tortured, uh, several have been killed, several have been handed over to their families to, to be killed. And from what we know, 106 have escaped Chechnya and then Russia and are now in the West and some unknown number are still in danger. Marcia, thank you for your talk. I, what would you say about two more details that could be discussed in, in this more general uh, puzzle? One kind of big is the relationship between Putin and Medvedev that were interpreted uh, during the so-called tandem uh, thing as quite queer, no? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in certain uh, public relations materials that they were disseminating about drinking tea together and uh, working out in gym together, things like that. And uh, the other one is smaller. There was one episode when Putin was just, uh, I think he was walking on the Red Square somewhere and he saw a little boy and he kissed him, like a six year old, yeah, kissed his belly. He, he uh, kind of pulled over his t-shirt and kissed his belly. It's a very awkward mm, thing to do. And, uh, and it produced a lot of allegations in these terms and probably this somehow fits into your description as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hadn't really thought of it from, from that, um, <laughs> from that vantage point, but I mean, I would argue that the the Putin Medvedev relationship is actually a perfectly traditional marital relationship, <laughs> where uh, where you know you have one partner who has all the power uh, and uh, and projects all the, all the strength, and another partner who has only ceremonial duties uh, and uh, you know attends to sort of humanitarian concerns and 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 the lighter side of things. Uh, as for uh, the, how Putin himself got pedophiled, that's, yeah, that's a really fascinating story because um, uh, I assume that he found out about it, uh, but of course, so, so yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of attention to this, to this the, the belly kiss of uh, Nikita, uh, the little boy, and um, and Putin's arch nemesis, Alexander Litvinenko, then still living, wrote uh, the, the escaped FSB uh, agent who had um, who had once been a whistleblower in the FSB, had, uh, had had a personal relationship with Putin, not a close one, but had gone to Putin uh, asking him to fight corruption in the FSB, bringing to him lots of, uh, uh, lots of information on corruption in the FSB, only to find himself arrested. He then uh, uh, fled Russia, settled in London, got political asylum, started working uh, for the British government, among other entities, and he uh, and started writing more and more uh, angry articles about Putin, culminating in an article about how Putin was a known pedophile, uh, and this was demonstrated in this uh, in this Nikita um, episode. Uh, there are people out there, I'm not one of them, uh, because I just don't 
I have the information. There are people out there who believe that uh, that's why Litvinenko was killed. Uh, uh, Litvinenko was famously poisoned with polonium uh, in November 26, uh, 2006 in London. I, you know, I don't know. Thanks. Uh, is there any downside to Putin's support for the pedophile campaign? Does it damage him politically in the long run? Does it give Dugin more power, for example, or en enable the Russian Orthodox Church to have more sway over his policies? Is there any downside to this? Yeah, um, I don't think so. I, um, I think that, so there, I mean, there, uh, the, uh, as, uh, as for Dugin, you know, I, I, Dugin comes up several times in this uh, in, in, in this excerpt because Dugin is a character in the book. But I don't want to overestimate Dugin's influence in Russian politics. Um, Putin is a rhetorical opportunist, and Dugin is uh, a prolific producer of rhetoric. So, uh, so Putin occasionally picks up something that Dugin has produced and, and uses it. Uh, and as Dugin himself actually puts it, I think, quite accurately, uh, he says, our power is negligible, our influence is immense. So he, you know, he makes words that Putin enjoys having in his mouth, but uh, uh, the, the, that doesn't give him power. Uh, and um, and I, don't think there, you know, I don't think that tension is even there. Um, with the church, I was actually argued that there's no tension there either, right? I mean, it's like, uh, and it's really hard always uh, to, to talk to an American audience about sort of the Russian state church relationship because it's like talking about the Russian relationship between the right hand and the left hand. They are attached to the same body, um, and they're not actually uh, you know, struggling for influence. I mean, the, um, the Kremlin does uh, like to have the ultimate control and to not let the church get too uh, uh, too frighteningly powerful. But you know, in the same way that the, the Putin wouldn't let one of his oligarchs get too powerful, right? It's uh, there's really no um, uh, no no question that it's part of the the mafia state of which uh, Putin is the patriarch. Um, I think the only costs, and, uh, and, and these have not been costs of the anti-pedophilia campaign. I mean, the, the, the anti-pedophilia campaign is completely cost-free. Uh, the anti-gay campaign has had minor political costs, right? And uh, well, it had one major, major political, uh, sort of, uh, uh, made, made, paid an unexpected political price for it uh, during the Olympics. Um, and this was this was truly unexpected. I think that part of probably an unarticula articulated um, logic of choosing the queers over the Jews was that last time it didn't go so well with the Jews and the West got all, uh, all head up about the Jews. And you know, there are all these uh, reminiscences about how the Americans would continue to bring up the fate of Soviet Jews every time uh, during all the high level negotiations and the, and the Soviets would uh, every time would, would just not be able to puzzle out why, why this was important, why this was even an issue. So we've seen sort of this exact same thing play out with, uh, with the gays um, where Putin the first, uh, in the first months after the anti-gay campaign began was confronted first in the, in the Netherlands uh, by questions that he really didn't expect about, about the anti-gay campaign. And then of course, uh, around the Olympics uh, came under a lot of criticism and uh, the President Obama's uh, the delegation to the Olympics uh, included two openly gay Olympians in a very pointed sort of rebuke. Um, but he obviously is not gonna have that problem with the current US administration. <laughs> Uh, and I don't think, I mean, I think that that's, you know, the price has been paid, it wasn't expected, but it, 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 it doesn't continue occurring. So you've maybe answered some of my question, but also thank you for your, for your talk. Uh, okay. So I'm reminded of a time in US history when the US government went after gays and a anti-communist, um, you know, campaign. And so it wasn't simply homophobia that was fueling that. There was a larger political gain. There was something geopolitically happening. There were power struggles happening within the United States. 
So what I'm wondering here is, I'm uh, persuaded by your arguments about why the gaze, but again, why is it, why the gaze? Like why focus on, like why, what's the power? And so both in terms, and I don't necessarily think a homophobia is the only thing fueling the focus on, uh, well first pedophilia, but then the conflation with you know, pedophilia and homosexuality. So what do you see the stakes of having a, a campaign that's focused on sexuality as fueling political legitimacy, and both domestically and, and internationally? I'm not sure I understand the question, I'm sorry. Aren't there other issues that could serve political efficacy that could be used for their power in terms of having conservative, they could focus on abortion, they could focus oh, on, sure. um, right? So not so much, you know, I understand what you're saying in terms of um, that gays have been or LGBTQ people are a target, but again, why is there so much political currency on that specific issue as opposed to other conservative issues, not only domestically, but internationally? Well, uh, oh, uh, yeah, see, I, 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 I don't want to broaden it out to, to, to sort of the international question because I think that's a whole other conversation and there are some major similarities, but there are also some major differences. I also actually would take issue with your description of the anti-gay campaigns in, in the United States. I, uh, that's not how I would interpret them, but that's, like, that's really a whole other conversation. But, um, but can I just clarify, though, that the way that going after so-called homosexuals were, was also about anti-communism. So it, it did something on the international arena, I guess, that's what I'm trying to say. But it was a domestic, the whole story was a domestic story, and there were no homosexuals involved, right? I mean, it was a phantom story. The story about the 81 homosexuals in the State Department uh, was an abstraction, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and in, the, in this sense, you know, Putin's campaign works in the, in the same way, and that's, of course, why it's so much better than abortion. Right? Abortion affects real women who are going to want to have abortions, you know, who are going to object, who are going to feel like they are being trampled upon. But the beautiful thing about queers is that uh, queers don't exist. Right? No one actually knows a queer person. Uh, queer, queer people are not going to start, you know, um, causing trouble at work or, or in politics or, God forbid, you know, march in the streets like they did in, uh, uh, like women did in Warsaw, uh, which is something that, of course, you know, Moscow is, 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 is aware of, right? Uh, women are a force that, um, that can exert political power. And so while abortion actually is getting uh, restricted and will be restricted, that has to be done softly, politically, delicately, in such a way that it doesn't get uh, a, a, a counter reaction. There's no risk of that with Russian queer people. Uh, the only way that Russian queer people really have reacted is uh, you know, either helped each other go into hiding or helped each other leave the country. You know, both basically ideal outcomes for this kind of campaign. Um, so I actually have a question about the atrocities in Chechnya. So I know that, for example, um, when the Russian military commits atrocities in Syria, the Russian media covers it up. Um, do they do that same sort of thing um, with the events that happened last summer in Chechnya? Um, there was, uh, so the, the, um, it was Nova Gazeta, uh, the, the quasi-independent Russian newspaper that broke the story. Of the uh, of the atrocities in Chechnya, it broke in a, in a really awful way. Uh, it basically, um, I mean, uh, at this point, journalism in Russia is all sort of, it, it, the best journalism in Russia is a journalism of accommodation and and arrangement. Um, and Nova Gazeta has been consistently able to report on Chechnya thanks to a series of accommodations and arrangements. And, and one of those arrangements is with, the, um, with, with Chechen law enforcement, which, where they had enough sources to corroborate the information about uh, the disappearances of gay men in Chechnya. Um, 
And the really awful thing about how they, they broke that story was that uh, they basically blamed it on gay activists. They concocted this elaborate narrative uh, of how um, a, the, the gay activist Nikolai Alexeyev, who has organized pride, uh, or not even pride parades, but attempts to hold pride parades around the country, f uh, got somebody to file um, uh, an application for a pride parade in, uh, in, in Karachayeva Cherkessia, uh, which is next door to Chechnya, and then and that were brought, that's what brought attention to um, uh, to the Chechen gays, and that's how it come they got rounded up, and so then the journalist interrogated Nikolai Alexeyev about where his winnings from the European Court have gone, and uh, and how much money he has he has made off of his gay activism, and um, and used its sources in Chechen law enforcement to confirm that these, uh, these people have been rounded up and, um, and killed, uh, you know, confirm, not like interrogate those law enforcement officials. And so it's an awful homophobic story that, uh, that also, as it turned out, had absolutely no basis in fact. Uh, when Human Rights Watch did its own investigation, they uh, they traced the first arrest to a young man who was picked up on drug charges, and his phone had some uh, had a, uh, some uh, erotic photos and some chats with other men. And so they started following the the threads and uh, and picking up men and looking in their phones and picking up more men and torturing them to to give up names. And that's how the um, the purge started. Uh, so most of the media coverage has basically been limited to Nova Gazeta. It, uh, it stopped being quite so homophobic um, after that and has actually done some, some pretty good work to help these men. Um, I don't know if there has been any coverage on the state media. I can't answer that uh, off the top of my head. Uh, it's actually an interesting question. Uh, hey, uh, thanks for coming. Um, so. A lot of authoritarian states adopt sort of like the forms of, uh, of of democracy. They put on show elections and all that. Russia seems to be one of like the most sophisticated in doing that. Um, how do you think that uh, like the the adoption of the the you know the um, rigged elections and all these sorts of and, and a parliament and these sorts of uh, you know trappings of, of democracy affects the way that power is exercised in, in Russia as compared to sort of like an uh, a, a regime that doesn't make any claim to any kind of democratic legitimacy. Um, it's actually pretty hard to find a regime that has no claim to democratic legitimacy. Even the Soviet regime had elections uh, and uh, no, known uh, in the official language as the free expressions of citizen will. Uh, so I, I don't know what you want me to compare Russia to. Uh, but um, uh, elections are an interesting ritual in Russia. They are, they are sort of a political inflection point. Uh, and uh, things happen around the time of elections. There is, sort of, there, there is a kind of uh, something that's, that almost resembles a public sphere that comes temporarily into being. Um, there, there's a, some kind of kind of political performance that's that's put on. So in that sense, I mean, there's a cyclical nature to Russian life that's connected to elections. But I can't answer your question about how it compares to uh, to regimes that really actually don't put on a show uh, of elections at all, because uh, because I'm not aware of such regimes. <laughs> Uh, Masha, thank you. I will ask, I'll take the liberty of being the in charge and the organizer, and so I'll just ask the two last questions, if you don't mind. And the first one is maybe a little too abstract and in, to a certain extent unfair. Um, your book, The Futurist <laughs> History, is um, dedicated to the great cultural hist uh, theorist, uh, the uh, late Svetlana Boim, uh, who is um, <clears throat> one of her best known books, The Future of Nostalgia. Uh, I find, you know, it just there is a lot of boim in, in the thinking, the, the way you write this particular book. Um, and thinking about the future, 
imagining the future. You, you, you left Russia twice. So first as a teenager with your parents, and then as um, an adult with your own children. Uh, do you imagine going back to Russia again, ever, and, and perhaps in an act of speculative fabulation? What are the ifs uh, that would allow such a, such a return? So um, I, uh, um, on July 4th of every year, the Carnegie Corporation of America publishes a full-page ad in the New York Times uh, that's called The Great, Great Immigrants. <laughs> And uh, so last year, I was, uh, I was honored to be on the list of great immigrants, which I thought was uh, an acknowledgement of my, uh, you know, how practice has made me a perfect immigrant. I have <laughs> emigrated so many times that, <laughs> that I'm really a great immigrant. And uh, um, I am... Um, I have learned in my, in my many immigrations that if you emigrate, you just have to emigrate. <laughs> you don't think about going back sometime in the future. That is not what emigrates do. So I don't think about it. But um, I'll actually, I'd, uh, I'd rather answer the question you didn't ask, uh, because the dedication is, uh, is a little bit of, um, of an inside joke between uh, me and Svetlana. Um, uh, in, um, in my previous book, she was, uh, she was still alive and she was, uh, uh, and in fact, we had lived together while I was researching uh, the book because I, I was researching it in, in Boston. So I, had, I, st I, I stayed at her house the, uh, the entire time I was there. And, um, and so in the, uh, and we, were, we kept having these arguments about the Boston bombers. And at the end of every argument, she would say, read Hannah Arendt. <laughs> and so in the, in the, in the dedication, uh, in, the, in the acknowledgments of, the, uh, of that book, it said, you know, and, 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 and to Svetlana Boehm, who told me to read Hannah Arendt. So she called and she left a voicemail message on, uh, read Hannah Arendt, and hung up. <laughs> so I read Hannah Arendt, I wrote a book, I dedicated it to the memory of Svetlana Boehm. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you. Well, and the last question um, uh -huh. I will ask is that uh, I mentioned the number of your books, but uh, I know that you have a new book uh, coming out soon. And if I may ask you about your uh, current and future projects beyond the future. Oh, it's Fortress Keep Planning. So I have, a, I have a little book coming out. It's, uh, it's almost, I mean, in my mind, it's almost a companion book to, uh, to this book. But of course, publishers don't do that. And in fact, it's a completely different publisher. But it's. Um, it's a photo book, uh, it's a book of photos and essays uh, that I did with the photographer Misha Friedman, also because we figured that no publisher could possibly um, resist a Masha Misha byline. Uh, and, uh, and we were right. Uh, and, uh, and the book is called Never Remember. Uh, and it's, it's a book of, uh, of essays and pictures of uh, gulag sites and gulag memorializations in contemporary Russia. So the subtitle, is, the subtitle is Looking for Stalin's Gulag in Putin's Russia. And what we did is we went to, uh, to places that I had actually reported from in the 1990s. And so the essays are about how memorialization has changed over the course of 20 years. Uh, and Misha went and photographed mostly things that aren't there. That was basically his brief, to go and, and photograph what you can't see. And I think he did a beautiful job. And that's coming out at the, end of, at the end of March. And I'm actually working on a really hopeful book about the future. Uh -huh. and, that's, and that's true, and that's all I'm gonna say. Well, on this hopeful note, right. uh, thank you so much, Masha, thank and thank you everyone. <laughs>